Would the panel please come to the stage? As it changes over, I know you're expecting a coffee break. We're going to power through. If you need a coffee, go out and grab one. But uh, otherwise, please grab your seats. Uh, Richard Muirhead, would you please come to the stage? Uh, Richard is uh, managing the next panel. This panel is titled Venture Capital versus ICO. Uh, Richard, if you'd kindly take the stage. Uh, are you mic'd up? If not, grab a mic. And take such and in, please invite your, your panel up to the stage. So I've known Richard for longer than I care to admit. He's a can I call you a veteran of investing? Master. Master. Oh sorry, Yoda, the great one. Um, in which case he's a very good person to moderate the panel. And with him are some real experts in, in the field and also some that are what I call crypto curious or on the cusp of changing their lives completely. Richard, over to you. Crypto curious, that's a, a phrase, isn't it? Um, hi, everybody. It's a little bit hot in here, is it? Everybody come in and sit down. Come and join the, join the panel. Uh, grab some water or coffee or whatever. So, so let's get everybody on, on stage. Um, three of us. We should have one, one more. We do have Stefan. Great. I'm going to sit here, yeah. So I'm going to ask these gentlemen, and it's a shame that they are all gentlemen, um, and we're all wearing way too similar outfits, um, to, uh, to introduce themselves. Um, yeah, so more seriously, my background is since 1995, um, working with open source projects to build software companies, built three, and then have found myself in my third uh, venture fund, Fabric Ventures, focused entirely on this space of decentralized computing, um, which I think is a pretty big wave. Um, uh, but you might ask, why have I kind of plunged in and uh, launched a venture fund fixed on this space, and then I'm moderating a panel questioning the very uh, existence of venture capitalists going forward? And the answer is going to come from our, our panelists. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, each of you just to quickly introduce yourselves, and we'll, we'll pile in. Go, Alex. Hi, good afternoon. So we are VC Fund, based in Luxembourg, investing in early stage in the US, launching soon a growth stage fund focused on tech. And I have to say that if we are seen as a traditional venture platform, uh, in a couple of months, we'll be uh, tokenizing our first spin-off fund on the blockchain uh, from Luxembourg. And I think it's going to be part of the topic tonight. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm co-founder of Red Alpine. Red Alpine is, uh, for more than 10 years, a, a classical VC investor. We, meanwhile, started to raise fund number four. And here, uh, the question is, should we tokenize the fund, at least partially? I'm an early crypto enthusiast, and uh, that is somehow a bit an internal conflict, because I see there is a lot of potential with the crypto economy. Nevertheless, it also threatens to um, basically disrupt the classical VC model. So that's going to be an interesting internal conflict here. Hi there, I'm Stefan. I'm definitely a crypto curious at this point, uh, not as far as those two yet. Um, with uh, Speed Invest, it's an uh, early stage tech fund out of Vienna. We invest across Europe. We've made 80 investments since 2011, just raising our fourth fund. And indeed, I'm also, as a fintech guy, we've been involved in companies early on like N26 or WeFox, Payworks, many others. Uh, whether or not we should um, yeah, also think about tokenizing at least some part of the second closing. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Christian Saller. I'm a general partner at Hot Spring Ventures. Yeah, if you want to a very sort of old world traditional venture fund, um, we, we've been around for 18 years. We have about a billion under management. Uh, we raise like 10 year funds from institutional investors um, that are very much, as I said, sort of in the, in the old model, non tokenized uh, model of, of venture capital. And We've done a lot of um, stuff in the past that has been quite successful, like Zalando and Delivery Hero and um, all sorts of other uh, successful companies. Um, and we, of course, very much looking right now what this new model of ICOs and 
raising capital uh, for a startup company in a very different way than from the VCs that has been done in the past, uh, how this is going to affect us as a venture fund. Thanks, guys. So um, just to further emphasize um, where I've ended up on this uh, is, and then pass back to the panelists, um, I've kind of adopted a phrase which I think I've kind of bastardized from several different sources, which is that tokenization is turning out to be to ownership what digitization was to content in the last couple of decades. And I think we've seen, whether it be movies or TV or you know, print or music, the impact has been pretty radical, uh, including at the level of kind of the functioning of our democracies. So um, given that, it seems pretty likely it is also going to impact the venture capital uh, world uh, and the capital markets in general. And this gentleman here, Alex, is already venturing boldly into that space and is going to tokenize his fund. So how is that going to work um, in terms of uh, liquidity? How are you managing liquidity? That's my first question. And the second one is how do you cope? So trying to be really practical, how do you, how do you work the fund to cope with the challenge of follow-on funding for your portfolio? So I have a question for the audience. How many of you hold at least one cryptocurrency? OK. How many of you are invested in the VC fund? Well, that's the issue here. So you see, I mean, why? Mic drop. Mic drop. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> four. Um, that's the issue here. Why would VC be kind of an elite sport, uh, segregated, illiquid, with long lockups, uh, LP, GP relationships, and complex sometimes LPAs, contracts, that are hard to read and understand by any lay investors? Um, what we think is that at one point you've got to embrace blockchain in a way that will empower and fractionalize and democratize VC. So now you have millions of people buying into ICOs, which are not securities yet. And the SEC stands, and uh, most regulators now are kind of pushing the envelope and saying that most ICOs may be actually securities. And that it's like buying equity. So VC and ICOs are going to collide, and VCs have to move on chain to embrace the trend. So one of the main features that we see for our investors by tokenizing a fund is liquidity. Liquidity impacts investors at two levels. The first one is ability to trade in, trade out, increase your exposure, lower your exposure over time, and don't get into a lockup that will take you for 10 years. Even that is hard to sell, and that's why the VC class is collecting much less than any other private equity class, risk is one thing, illiquidity is another. The other point is that if you look at the typical financial system, if, you look, if, if an investor wants to invest in a fund, he looks at two things, the liquidity premium and the risk premium. If you remove the liquidity premium from the equation, you end up lowering your expectations in terms of yield, not saying that VC will do a bad job, but it will make the asset class more affordable, more understandable. That's what we call liquid IRR. And this time value of money will create value. Because you, if you can capture now increases in NAV in the short term after one year, two years, that's worth more than a euro in 10 years. OK, so, but if you're an entrepreneur, and I want to be sure that you're going to be in a position as a fund to support me throughout my entire journey, how are you going to make sure that that's the case? Well, the fund, per se, and I can't disclose it right because our, our, our white paper will be out in a, in a couple of weeks, but we, we will raise the entire fund up front, and we found a way to structure it, to allow, not to have a J-curve in terms of IR. Uh, because you can, you can tell us here. No. <laughs> yeah. We are working on vesting bonuses on, uh, on the first investments, which will give a premium to the early stage investors in the fund. Uh, overall, it's, it's, a, it's a feature that allows to make up for the upfront commitment by the investors. And over time, you've got your investors' cash to invest in projects. And that's how it's going to work. It's, more, it's closer to an investment corporation. You think of Warren Buffett being the first investment corporation, Berkshire Hathaway. It's the way you can have long-term capital and follow on with your investments. Super, thank you. So let's move on to, to Michael. I'm going to try and keep it sequential and fair. Um, so that topic of liquidity, if it's going to generate value, um, how is that going to be actually delivered by venture capitalists? They're not really used to liquidity. 
Yeah, absolutely. This is um, probably going to be a new world for the VCs, and I see that on many or several levels. First of all, if you hold tokens or coins, then uh, there may be opportunities to sell those coins when the price is getting higher, and uh, then you have to develop as a VC skills that commonly are being found these days at hedge funds. So basically, the VC is not just investing and holding and trying to grow the value of its holding. It, he has also to learn to trade. And I think this is something fundamentally new. Um, I believe also that providing liquidity on the fund level is going to add value because it's not going to be uh, illiquid as a class which your money is going to be locked up for 10 years. If you can trade your uh, fund shares, that of course will make uh, the, the investment more attractive as soon or as long as it's tradable. And with having tokens, that's much, much more easy. But if we go back to the, the question of liquidity, but also uh, the, the mechanics of liquidity, you know, how, how does that look in this new setup? If you're assuming you're investing in a, a token, not just a, that has utility in a network. Yes. So regarding the mechanics, I'm not too optimistic because we still will encounter the same issues that penny stocks these days have. So you will have to provide a, an active market making mechanism. You will have to provide a lot of information and also coverage, analyst coverage, because otherwise you're doomed to have the fate of a penny stock, which is not getting out of a very low uh, trading life. And, and if you're sitting there with this temptation to trade out of your investment that you promised the entrepreneur you would hold for the long term, how do you maintain that, that bargain with the entrepreneur? Yeah, I guess there has to be some expectation management up front. Uh, you cannot do that out of the blue because that would definitely be a bad sign. So moving on to Stefan, is this perhaps why you're still just crypto curious? There's, there's a challenge here. You're, you're there. You're, you exist to serve entrepreneurs, and it's not clear yet how that's going to serve entrepreneurs? Well, I don't know. I think <clears throat> I'm very open, again, to test this. I think liquidity, liquidity making a VC investments a liquid asset class is interesting. What I have to say, though, is what I've seen anecdotally, listed funds, VC funds, they've had enormous challenges, right? And there's a reason, I guess, why so few actually have done this. Um, and, um, and, and especially those with hundreds and hundreds of portfolio companies, extremely difficult to assess value. Um, and and um, as my colleague was saying, I think um, you have to weigh uh, the advantages of liquidity, which should make fundraising a lot easier, I, I, th I believe, with um, the fact that you will have to hire literally people who can manage capital markets. because. We don't have that experience. But I also see it on a different level. I think we have a fundamental, I mean, that my interest is not just on a VC level, it's on a portfolio level. Um, we are in continental Europe. I mean, ap apart from London and maybe Stockholm, um, most of Europe uh, does not have a functioning capital market for young companies, right? Let's not forget that. And so I think our geography in particular has, there's a huge, um, uh, you know, political interest, I would say, uh, to, to, to use blockchain and crypto to drastically remove barriers of entry and costs for companies. And I'm not just talking startups, I'm talking any enterprise. So that's in our fundamental interest. If we can get those portfolio companies faster to the capital markets, I think everyone will be very happy. But so it sounds like you're pretty bullish. So then what is the proposition of a VC? Maybe we'll move to Christian. Uh, but before I come to that, another thought sure. here. I mean, I think there's, there's pros and cons to liquidity, right? I, I was, before becoming a VC, I was working for a startup company that then went public on NASDAQ. And of course, it was great to be a public company and uh, have an IPO and so on. But after we went public, everyone was watching the stock market every day and sometimes several times per day. So instead of focusing on the, on the long term and how to build the company, we looked at the short term fluctuations. Now at the time when we went public, we were, we were already a pretty big company, so the fluctuations weren't so big. 
But if you have liquidity in a very early startup, the, the fluctuations will be huge. And I mean, you can see that for some of the ICOs that happened in the past. I mean, one of my favorite examples, the Denta coin. I don't know if anyone here owns the Denta coin. If you did, at some point you were very rich, and now you're very poor again. The, the market cap over the last two or last three months went from 100 million to 3 billion back to 100 million. So it went up by 3,000% and then went down again by 97%. By and I find it very difficult to see how you can actually work on the long term building a company in a situation where you have these fluctuations and everyone is an owner and everyone uh, feels this every day in their personal wealth. So I think, as I said, there's a pro and a con to liquidity. And maybe for very early companies, it's not even good to have liquidity. But the other question you just asked, I mean, that, that's a very interesting question because, I mean, VVCs, we pride ourselves on not, uh, not only providing money, but also providing, like, value to the, to the companies. And, um, yeah, probably that is true. And if you talk to an investor who, uh, sorry, uh, if you talk to an entrepreneur who has been successful, usually they will say that the VCs they had on the board helped them a lot, but also they didn't have a ch uh, another opportunity, right? They, they had to take VC money because that was the only way to, to raise capital for an early stage company. Now it's possible to, to raise capital through an IPO, maybe don't give up any control rights, don't even give up any equity if you raise a utility token. And so it's a really interesting question. Will people still, will entrepreneurs still come to VCs and take money from VCs? Which is a little bit like having a parent where like you get money from the parent, but also it comes with a lot of rules. Or will they go through the ICO way and take money from the public market? But there's basically no rules and no tough parent attached to it. But if I imagine, um, you know, us all being publicly listed through, through, through um, crypto. The, f the funds. Uh, the funds, market. correct. I mean, you know, we, the, the relationship between us and the LPs will dramatically change, no? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, the LPs, I know a lot of them personally, and they basically trust us to create, you know, a, a, net, a net IRR above 20% over 10 years. And so they don't call me every day. They don't call me every week. They get a quarterly report. Uh, there's events we do, they, they get to know our startups. Now that relationship dramatically changes once you're listed. Imagine you, our, our stock goes up and down like the one you just described. You, you're going to sit on the phone all day with your LPs. I'm not sure that's a lot of value add. I think there is one other element that needs to be considered as well for everybody who is going ICO now uh, and in the future. If you're a young company and now one, uh, suddenly you have several thousand investors. Um, that's a really big difference from having one or two VCs where you can sit at the table, discuss stuff, discuss why you're delayed, discuss what can be done. So suddenly you have two, three, five, ten thousand uh, investors and they want to see you deliver. And if you don't deliver, they really show that to you that they don't like it by selling the token. This is a completely different world, and it has a lot of challenges. Okay, allow me to disagree a bit. <laughs> I think that transparency, I mean, if we're here, and because we believe in decentralized trust, smart contracts, and the fact that blockchain is gonna impact the life of potentially everybody in the coming years, I agree on the reporting complexity, uh, how do you imagine NAV, but overall, what you want is transparency overall, even in VC, even in private equity, real estate funds. Um, long lockups are a way sometimes to say, well, we need capital in the long term, which is true as a VC fund and investor. But at the same time, if you're doing a good, a good job, why don't share it? Why not show it? And just say, your token may move alongside NAV reportings and expectations and expectations could create variety. But down the road, as we saw this morning, variety is prone, is, is, is typical of young markets, and we have to start somewhere. Um, and, that's, and we all know that as investors in crypto. Um, so overall, I think transparency per se, if that's the root of what we want to do, and I think we all agree on this, that we want to share and open up the VC industry to more people beyond the ICO investments only. Sure, so I'm certainly in the camp that <clears throat> there is uh, very little of the world's capital that is actually deployed in a kind of gainful manner at the moment. Most, most of the world's capital is 
actually could have deployed in order to not lose it and therefore not lose your job. And I think there's the promise here of being able to open the floodgates and get that capital deployed on interesting things like you know, even missions to Mars and, and the rest of it. So, so that floodgate is being opened. It sounds like venture capitalists are going to have to sharpen their game quite a bit to continue to have a seat at the table. But nonetheless, there is a, a strong role for VCs, at least that's, that's what I believe and I understand. Um, so what, but what about, you know, the question of uh, compliance? When I'm talking to some of the most, um, should we say, conservative limited partners, that's the big question for them. How, how, you know, how do we know that we're not involved in a transactions with bad actors and we're going to be regulated? How's that playing out? And how's that playing out across different geographies? Any comments on that? And if anybody has any questions in the last minute or two, then please... Uh, just brew them up and we'll pick off two or three at once and then we'll present them to the panel. So quick, rapid fire on compliance. Compliance, your question is regarding the investment. How do I check if the ICO or the token I invest in is a good token? Or the compliance no, of the fund with the regulations? it's immediately listed on a secondary market uh, and someone's buying it, and so you, you may be sitting alongside on the token registry alongside somebody who's actually just used that transaction to launder money that they made from running guns. Yeah, that's certainly a huge challenge, and I guess the area KYC AML has to step up to its game, and uh, you have to be able to whitelist wallets and, and, and all of and that so stuff. Any other thoughts? Uh, to totally agree. I mean, I, I assume that um, this whole movement will eventually have to go through the same rigorous KYC AML requirements like everyone else. Uh, assuming that, though, I have to say I'm really hoping that this movement will create some really good tech solutions for KYC mm -hmm. AML because we really, really need it. I mean, we're suffering. I mean, I feel so bad. I'm just doing a cash call right now on the fund. I feel terrible having uh, my investors uh, forcing them to go through this. And it's all PDFs and printouts. <laughs> it's crazy, right? We need tech Post solutions for this. So, so if this movement can change it, we're all for it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess, like people in the crypto world sometimes think of regulation as something that's inherently bad. And I think it's, that's not the case. I mean, there's probably over-regulation in a lot of things. But on the other hand, we will need some regulation to avoid exactly what you described before. Hands up for the questions. Yeah, yeah. my, my belief, to, is, I'll get the final point on that one, is that actually what people perceive as the greatest weakness of the crypto capital markets will actually turn out to be its greatest strength when it's all programmatic, as we've been describing. And so that's going to be really interesting consequences. Hand, hands up, quickly. Hello. Uh, I'm Vincent Rouge from Token Estate. We're based in Geneva. Thank you for this panel. Uh, what I think is a really interesting point that we should touch on is, you know, are you guys investing in ICOs? We've been speaking for 20 minutes and we all agree that, you know, issuing token is the new way to finance startups and we haven't touched on this very fundamental point. Do you invest in ICOs? Put your hands up, guys. Who's investing in, in ICOs yeah. or pre? Yes. The, the crypto curious are not yet. Well, but, well, what do you mean? We, we privately are no. pretty curious. Or the money that no, it's LPs like is entrusting you, us. Yeah, you no, as a yeah. VC, would you buy a token? You know, because yes. So three of us, yes, we're doing it already. Absolutely not. We already have portfolios. And two are not allowed to yet, but I think they're pretty curious. That's my... And, my, and, uh, and then, <laughs> before giving the mic back, back, is like, are you guys comfortable with the loss of governance that as a VC you have when you buy your token? I mean, you, you spoke about the liquidity, right? So you buy a token, you have a liquidity premium, but you lose governance. And we all know that as a VC, you'll either you, 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 know, you spray and pray, or either you kind of get actively involved and all that. So how do you negotiate that? Thank you very much. So we're going to take a few questions together. Got that one. Governance, when you buy tokens. Next one. Uh, Philip Todd, Kickstarter app. From an entrepreneur's perspective, I don't see venture capital versus ICO as a trade-off or an either-or uh, decision. No? As from a company perspective, both sources of capital can add different value besides cash on the account. My question to you guys is, um, me as an entrepreneur, I can, once being sourced or funded by venture capital and uh, ICO money, could redistribute that value I create, not proportionally to the venture capitalist and to the ICO investors. How would you 
deal with that new question, do I get the value redistributed to the venture capitalists or to the ICO investors, and how do I balance this kind of, um, let's say, trade-off? Okay. I need to change. Uh, so it's kind of linked. So it's going to be both, and how's governance of you know, shareholder and tokenholder rights going to work? Okay. Thank you. Hi. Dan Huber, uh, running a family office. Um, we hear today a lot that um, uh, technology companies should really think why using blockchain. So you guys are running an existing business model, so explain to us why you're using blockchain. Okay, small question. Thank you, why use blockchain? I think, okay, so rapid fire, we're talking about governance rights for tokens and... Distribution of value. And, and, and could that lead to problems with the distribution of value between equity holders, token holders, and different investors? And why use blockchain? If you allow me on the liquidity question, um, end of the day, the vision of Vitalik Buterin and he, is the DAICO. It's a DAO. DAO is a, now has been kind of has a negative aspect because of the hack that happened. But you think about the mantra of what they are building with Ethereum, it's like a decentralized, autonomous venture capital fund. And f five years ago, I went back to my uh, university uh, 10th reunion and I asked one of the professors, Josh Lerner, who is kind of the VPE guy in the US. And it was back then when crowdfunding was taking off in 2012. And I asked him, do you think crowdfunding is going to displace VCs? And he told me, I don't think so, because you, need, you still need expertise. At one point, what you mentioned about governance is that maybe you could introduce in the tokenized fund incentivized deal flow. You can motivate your token holders to share projects and, and share the carry with them. Down the road, will you have voting systems in decentralized VC tokenized funds? So that's maybe the end of the story. Lots more innovation possible in this programmatic world. I would agree. Good. Keep it rapid fire just because I think we're over time. Next. Thanks, Alex. The, the main question with the governance is especially on the utility token side, and there I, I, I agree it's not solved. Uh, at least out of the, uh, the perspective of a VC. When it comes to tokenized uh, equity, then of course you can have voting rights in the token and that can be executed by the VC. And maybe if you have a large enough stake, then you even get something like a, a seat in the board. So that still can remain uh, in the same uh, And we see way. a lot of the best deals or best opportunities are normalizing to that kind of standard. Yeah. And I mean, I think the honest answer is we, we don't know yet, right? I mean, the, in the old world, uh, as a VC, we invested in equity and we got a lot of governance rights. In the new world, and it was clear that if a company is successful, the value will be in the equity. In the new world, it's not clear is the value in the equity or is it in the utility token? Maybe you want to be in the utility token and the equity doesn't have any value in the end, or maybe it's the other way around. And it's not clear yet how governments, uh, go governance will be, uh, will be distributed, will be important, will be implemented in these models. So if we have this panel again in a couple of years, I think we will all be give, uh, able to give answers. Right now, it's, it's still all very So fluid. just a small question of fundamental valuation techniques. We could do that on another panel. Stefan, yes. we're good. Eric, are we done? That was my favorite panel. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. You're our favorite moderator. <laughs>